shall we wait a little bit more to, for Sonia? Well, I'm just going to send her a note and 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 see what's um, happening. But no, I, I I think we can start, and then um, hopefully she will. Um, Okay, so let's start. Uh, Thirty minutes past from the time yeah. we start. So, welcome. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Future of Capitalism session ten. Uh, we only have two sessions left for this course. We have uh, today's title slightly changed uh, in the last minute. Tomorrow's value creation trends, experiments, and toolkits. Uh, I will be again opening and closing today's session. As usual, uh, I saw many of you students have changed already your Zoom name, but if you haven't, please do so accordingly. Also, observers, uh, please put O in front of your Zoom name. Uh, your cooperation is very much appreciated. Uh, we have uh, John Elkington, founder and port chief pollinator uh, of Volans, uh, participating from London, UK. He has been uh, he has been one of the supporters of this project from the very beginning, and he has been participating as a guest speaker from very, from the very first edition. Uh, thank you very much, John. And as you have received email from Derek, our program management office, that we have had to change the speaker. Uh, we initially had Pavan Sakdeth. Uh, author of Corporation 2020. Uh, he also participated in last year's edition, but uh, unfortunately he's not available for his personal circumstance. And we are very much grateful uh, for John to uh, invite uh, Sonia Holt, uh, if I, uh, I don't know if I pronounced her surname properly, uh, but okay. joining from, uh, I understand, from Switzerland. Uh, I think Sonia is on the way to join this connection, but in the meantime, also, let me introduce Professor Lawrence Law uh, from National University of Singapore Business School. He is a director of Center for Governance and Sustainability. He will be facilitating today's session uh, together with Sonia and John. So Lawrence, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Junichi. Yes, I'm so happy to be the moderator for today's session. Is uh, everybody good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. I think the topic today is actually quite interesting. Some of you will recall uh, in the slide just now is on tomorrow's value creation, trends, experiments, and toolkits. In fact, I was so enthralled uh, in the title by the three words that start with T, tomorrow, which is what is value tomorrow, number one, and what are some of the key trends uh, in companies and businesses that will lead to the value creation, and more importantly, the third T, which is two keys. So what we want is not just concepts tonight, hopefully the speakers, which I will introduce later one by one, uh, will give us some tips for us to actually apply uh, in our career, in our professional development. And for today's topic, uh, it's quite wide ranging actually. And I would say it will center around a few key points. I do not want to speak too much, but basically what, what is the purpose of say a company? Is it the best organizational form for value creation? Who does it serve? Uh, when is it serving, why, where, and what is value. So, so the, the five W's is very important. Who, uh, when, why, where, and what. And I think it's quite uh, very apt that we have the first speaker today. I think uh, John Elkington, uh, Mr. Elkington is actually not a stranger to many of us. I think uh, when we started our academic pursuit, Many of us will have heard about the triple bottom line. So this is actually John's claim to fame, although even recently he said that there's a need for a recall. And John is, of course, chairman and chief pollinator. 
I think this is the first pollinator that I have met. So he's going to pollinate us with all his wisdom. And I think he has an illustrious career pioneer, um, of course, in sustainability, business advisor, thought leader, influential people, top CSR leader. Uh, and I think I do not need to say too much, but bring all the audience to John. John, uh, you can actually start to deliver and also you can weave in the question and answers as well as you speak. Okay, John, all yours. Thank you, Lawrence. And, and I'm thrilled to see that Sonia is with us wearing radiant green. And um, Sonia, hello. And thank you very much for doing this um, today. Um, hello, everyone. I, it, 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 it's a it, it, genuine delight to be involved in this conversation. As I will say right at the end of my presentation, I think that in many ways the business school sector has been a laggard, or slow to adopt uh, some of this new thinking. But I'm really very impressed by the way that the Future of Capitalism Alliance Consortium, whatever we call it, um, has picked up the agenda and really uh, pushed it. And it's been a, it's been fascinating to watch it uh, evolve. I'm going to talk for about 45, 50 minutes. And then I think what we would like to do then is just see whether there are any immediate comments, questions that people have, maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, of, of responses. Um, and then I'll hand over to Sonia. And just to give you a little bit of background as to why I was so keen to have Sonia as part of this. Um, she and I have worked together now for about five or six years. Um, based at, She's based at Novartis. Uh, and when we first started working together, she was talking about impact at a time when negative, positive impact, net impact, all of this stuff was on the edges of most people's consciousness, but not really mainstream, unless you happen to be an impact investor and that was your uh, profession. And it's been very interesting to see the way in which that language has increasingly come into the mainstream. And, and one of the really exciting things about Sonia's work at Novartis was when uh, we started, uh, we had a two years running, we had face-to-face um, -face sessions, and there were about 30 or 40 people, all of them from Novartis. Then we had COVID hit, and in very short order, the, the, the following years, you had a 1,000 people virtually, then we had 2,000 uh, people joining uh, for a couple of days of, 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 of conference. Um, and then eventually Novartis got to the point where it was slightly worried about just what was happening here and pulled it back internally. And then the, that year there were about 800 to 900 participants. So we'd gone from 30 to 40 to 800 uh, to 900. So I think that's just an indication of why Sonia's thinking. And she's done a book called The Case uh, for Impact, which I'm sure she will talk about. But Sonia, delighted to have you. Uh, part of this and what I'm going to do now is just um, thank you John and uh, just share my screen can I just check that that is uh, working for everyone yes it is great so I, I'm going to talk a bit about value creation yeah. just, just, yes. just information we, we see your window uh, also the slides before and after as well really how odd um I'm not quite sure how to deal with that. So, so you're not seeing a full screen. Well, maybe you can just click the slideshow button on the on the right bottom. Yeah, um, I'll do that again. So, is can you see it now? Or is no? It's let me just go back to the front one. Do that. So that's showing to me full screen, but not to you. Not to us, yeah. Um, if anyone's got any in suggestions, I'd very great be very grateful to take them. But um, yeah, this is this, this is showing. Let me just stop sharing again. Come out. Maybe and just maybe I don't know. Excuse yeah. me. At the moment that we're sharing, there are options yeah. of sharing a window or sharing a particular a particular uh, screen that are different settings. And maybe it's because of that. It happened maybe to me. Okay, no, I, I appreciate the um, 
the thought. I'm just trying to go back into the, there we are. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to try and come out of the whole thing. Um, so I'm, again, this is showing, um, I can see the full screen, but you you clearly can't. Um, and I can't now escape. Let me just come out of this altogether. Um, John, we don't see the screen at this moment. So if you could upload... No, I know. I'm, I'm coming out of it entirely just to see whether I can go back in and... Um, Uh, but still, I think uh, we can see the main, uh, you know, slide. So uh, that would be. I'm just not perfect, but yeah. No, but it. Uh, I've just gone back into shared screen, and actually, the presentation has now disappeared. All right, let me just try this again. Um, there we go. For that. Apologies to everyone for the uh, interruption of service, but we'll be back with you very shortly. Um, hi. So I'm trying to go back into the um, the the Zoom call and share it again, but now the the thing is not showing the um, presentation at all. Um, you you have to push escape because you're presenting it still. That's why the whole screen that you are facing is just your slide. So you have to come out. From presenting yeah. and push escape, and then when you share, share the secondary screen, not the primary screen. You were sharing the primary screen. Okay, so I'm just trying to think about how I do that. <laughs> Slide. I'm just having a look. It's it's gone into some sort of different. Uh, it's it's not it's not the sharing screen that I had previously. It's a different one. Let me see if I can go basic. Professor, uh, allow me to share the slideshow. Just please let me know when you want to go to the next slide. That's not going to work because the um, there are so many builds. Oh, oh let's try that. Okay. Uh, also, the date is wrong on this particular one, but let, let's try this. Um, okay, l let's uh, start from here. Um, so I last week I was in the north of France in Normandy. And some of you will know that region. And this photograph, which I took while I was there, is of a very beautiful uh, port called uh, Enfleur. And as I walked around the uh, town, I was wondering why, where did all the wealth come from for, to build these extraordinary um, houses and buildings? And once I started to look into it, I found that the answer was it came from slavery. This was one of the five biggest slave ports in France uh, for a very long time with um, African slaves being uh, shipped to the Americas. And also they were very heavily involved in fisheries. Um, so uh, they were involved in the overfishing of the uh, Newfoundland Grand Banks uh, where in the space of something like uh, 60, 70 years, the cod population collapsed to 1% uh, of its original uh, size. Uh, now the economy is obviously based on tourism, but all around us 
are these invisible clues to the way in which our economies have created wealth uh, in the past. And we tend to forget uh, a lot of that history. I'm not going to take us through a lot of history, but it was just one of those reminders that um, we really do need to uh, pay more attention to the processes of value creation. And one of the things that I'm going to uh, focus on, and particularly I suspect in the discussion, is the need not simply to focus on companies and their supply chains. And that's that's where I spent much of the last 50 years uh, professionally. But increasingly, we've got to look at uh, the market environments within which companies operate and work out how we can um, change those over time. So could I have the next slide, please? Could I have the next slide? Nanji? Are you Nanji? You not seen the next next slide? No, no. I'm wondering whether this is going to work. Uh, I'm just wondering whether I shouldn't try and pull up my um, previous uh, slide. Let me just have a look at this. This the right slide. So, can you see it, the full screen or not? Not, not slide yet. Nanji, not yet. Can you withdraw? Withdraw. So you can't see the full screen. Uh, John, we don't see the screen at all at this moment. That's interesting because I've I've pressed on the uh, the share button. Let me try that again. Okay, let me just try this. Can you see now the my the the, the screen? Yes, it comes. And can you see the just wonderful. full screen? Yes, wonderful, wonderful. We we see now. Now perfect. Well, apologies, apologies. Let me run through because this we've seen. The the the, the first thing to say is that. I have been 50 years professionally in this space now as part of the generation that woke up with this sort of imagery, um, uh, woke up to the fact that uh, capitalism and markets and value creation uh, were uh, not well suited for the future into which we were uh, moving. And when I introduce uh, Volans, I find it very difficult uh, in the sense that we a very small organization based in uh, London, uh, fairly uh, diverse client base in different parts uh, of the world. They tend to be either individuals within companies or companies that are really interested in, in, in moving towards some form of transition or transformation. Novartis is on the list and we'll be hearing from Sonia uh, shortly. Um, one of the things that's very striking at the moment, you know, I, I came up with the name sustainability for an organization in 1987. Uh, at that time, no one was using the term. It had been used once previously in, in, in that current sense uh, back in 1973. But to see now the language everywhere is, is a little bit of a surprise and in a way a little bit of a, uh, a shock and to some degree also a bit of a concern because it's being used, but very often not fully uh, understood. And I think what part of the uh, challenge that we now face, and it's something I'm trying to think through um, at this very moment, um, these, the, 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 this, the, this current period of time, how do we really increasingly uh, uh, focus on, on market dynamics and shift markets over time? And there, there, there are moments where transformation happens in particular parts of the economy and with um, IT and uh, the virtual economy and the internet and, and now artificial intelligence, uh, we see politicians increasingly involved. I mean, Donald Trump and Mike Pence shown here, but uh, in increasing concerns that we're going through a period of time when these new technologies are disrupting uh, our economies in ways that we um, are not really well used to dealing with. 
Pavan Sukhdev, who who was meant to be on on, on this call as well, um, I work with him at GIST, um, which is an investment uh, platform uh, firm. And I, one of the reasons why I think if you haven't heard him speak before, I, I really do encourage you to um, track down his work, is quite some time ago, he did the a major study called The Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. And in many ways, I think that work, trying to get economics to adapt itself uh, to a very different uh, sense of reality, particularly driven around uh, ecosystems and biodiversity, it was a very early e exercise in trying to transform economics. So I, I recommend him very highly, but I'm, I'm, I'm equally excited that Sonia has been able to join us um, and uh, would very much look forward to what, he hearing what she has to say uh, shortly. Now, just to very quickly run through what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the reason why I think at this particular moment, even 2024 itself, will in retrospect uh, look to, to have been a, an inflection point in the evolution of the uh, change agenda for business. I'm going to talk about the way in which um, much of the focus has been on, as I've said, companies and supply chains and so on. And the very the, the, group, the problem is that very often what we're doing is we're cleaning up individual companies with corporate social responsibility or ESG or whatever, and then putting them back into uh, dirty water, uh, the marketplace, which has other forms of incentive. All of this, I think, is driving us towards new forms of capitalism. I'll touch on those. And one of the things that is really difficult for corporate leaders now to get their brains around because very often they've been asked or instructed to stay out of politics because we didn't trust them to do the right thing if they were involved uh, in politics. Campaign, campaign finance is a, is a perfect example of that in the United States, for example. Um, but now we increasingly we're expecting companies to have uh, a political role, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The language of impact is 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 inflecting every aspect of this uh, discussion, this agenda, and I think um, that can only continue to grow over time. And so we will conclude uh, with Sonia's uh, uh, introduction to how she uh, sees that impact story. So inflection point. We're really singularly poor as a species at thinking around corners, thinking the unthinkable. I just... Uh, a few weeks back watched a BBC program on the NASA uh, Columbia um, disaster, where all the clues, all the evidence were, were, were there for, for, for days ahead of the disaster, and in some cases um, for years ahead of time. But we just simply could not see, NASA could not see, uh, what was going to happen. And in many ways, I think, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's climate change, whether it's the big social and political issues, uh, this is a problem that, that we continually uh, wrestle with. And, and I was on the faculty of the World Economic Forum uh, for seven years, so I, I, I pay a certain amount of attention to what the nature of the discussion is there. Sonia's also been involved in the forum as well. Um, and this year was really quite striking. Um, some of you will have been there. Some of you will have uh, seen uh, the conclusions in the uh, media afterwards. On the right, you have the uh, forum's uh, listing of 10 critical issues uh, over the next decade. If you, if you look for the next two to three years, the, the listing uh, looks different. But over the next decade, if you look at the top four and the 10th, the, the they're all environmental uh, in, in, in one way or another. Um, if you look at those sort of red and, and sort of slightly purple colors, what you have there is a set of concerns, a set of challenges, which are going to get in the way of effective uh, action to deal with uh, the green uh, challenges. Um, whether that's uh, misinformation or disinformation, information it's the impact of um cyber insecurity and, and and the crucial thing particularly this year the polarization of our societies and on the left what you have and i've just seen the update of this today i haven't um 
put it into this presentation. But all the evidence suggests that around the world, uh, it, our oceans are warming at a quite unprecedented uh, level. So I think we will look back at 2024 as a, as a year when the, the, the penny finally started to drop. People started to wake up to the scale, nature and scale of what we're facing. And some of the things that we're seeing now, I mean, not, not just the Baltimore Bridge, not just the Suez Canal being uh, blocked by the Houthi rebels, but the Panama Canal now being uh, very difficult to get ships through because of the um, the decline in water inputs um, in, in, into the canal because of rainfall uh, pattern uh, shifts. We are in a period of time where suddenly the evidence is starting to present itself in very different ways. Now, the people who are paying attention perhaps more attention than uh, our age groups, uh, if I can make a, a wild ass assumption around here. I mean, people from their, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, in my case now 70s, um, we've sort of grown up with these issues. We, we sort of think that someone will sort them out at some stage. The, the likelihood is that somebody will not. And the younger generations uh, are starting to wake up to this uh, and the, the the degree of climate anxiety and so on, I think I, I'm increasingly concerned about. If you look at that blue, light blue bar, the baby boomers, that, that that's my generation, and that runs out uh, pretty much uh, in 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 the next decade uh, or so. And I think the the point of this slide is to make uh, a, a, a rather simple argument that the sustainability uh, uh, agenda, as we currently see it was a baby boom project, as was environmentalism, as was much of the human rights um, campaigning and so on. And the different generations that are now coming up, including some of the people on this call, are going to be thinking about this very differently uh, indeed. And therefore the agenda will, will, will evolve uh, very fast, I believe, in the next sort of three to five uh, years. Greta has been one of the uh, examples of the, the way in which um, new voices uh, are coming into this uh, space. And it's not just Greta. I mean, I, I do a lot of work in places like Brazil. And um, one of the things that I find really striking is the way in which you might assume that it would be Northern Europe, uh, Canada, places like this, where the concern around climate would be at its greatest, California and, 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 uh, and so on. It's really interesting when you look at countries like the ones shown on, on, on this slide, it was an article published in uh, Nature, the Science uh, Journal, to see that um, in what we might call the global south, uh, the concern around climate issues is growing very, very rapidly uh, indeed. And in, in, in the high income country group, it's interesting to see Portugal, when this study was done, uh, showed younger people in the country, this was this was in the wake of uh, some fairly major fires, which probably had a, a, an impact as well. But younger people are waking up, and the impact of this is going to be felt for a very long time uh, to come. And as a result, one of the things we start to see is the CEOs of major companies like Shell, uh, most conspicuously, beginning to wonder aloud in public. Are their companies going to be seen to be, and are they going to be on the right side of history? Uh, and I think that is quite significant. And the, the 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 reality is that many industries that we have taken for granted, many uh, major companies uh, that we uh, see as uh, almost perpetual, uh, you know, sort of um, that they're going to be there forever, are going to disappear in relatively short order. And one of the things to watch very carefully, and it's, it's one of the things that I've worried about for some time, is that some of this youthful anxiety around these sorts of issues will flash over into less peaceful forms of uh, protest. Andreas Malm is just one of the people who's been thinking through, how do you stop fossil fuel consumption if the fossil fuels industry is not going to decide of its own volition? Uh, to stop or scale down at a, a, a sensible rate, and governments are not going to do enough to put the brakes on. His view is you start to hit the infrastructure. We can we can discuss this in the in in in, in the conversation later on if you like. But I think this is going to be something that uh, builds uh, relatively rapidly 
if the evidence continues to build, that climate is wobbling very seriously indeed. Um, I, I mentioned earlier on that a lot of the focus of the CSR, corporate social responsibility, um, shared value, uh, ESG uh, world has been on individual companies. And we've really got to start looking at the uh, water around them. And you see that with some of the scandalous uh, corporate uh, stories recently. Boeing, I, I have family who work for Boeing uh, for decades. It's, it's been a brilliant company in terms of uh, quality and safety for a very long time. But when they um, acquired McDonnell Douglas and they moved their headquarters from uh, Seattle to Chicago, something broke. Uh, and one, with, one of the things that I think people are, are beginning to see is that the, in, the enormous focus on shareholder value has really potentially helped damage and potentially, if this continues, um, destroy a very major brand, a very major uh, company. And you see the same sort of willful ignorance in some ways. This was uh, a couple of years back now, but where the major bank, HSBC, their global head of responsible investing basically said in public, who cares if Miami and, and, and Florida are underwater in 100 years? That's not our business. That That's not what the markets we operate in are interested in uh, remotely. Now, as many of you will know, he lost his job. He now writes a, a provocative column for the Financial Times. But he, he did do us a service by pointing out the fact that this is how money very often thinks. Now, we happen to be at a time when the agenda that we're talking about today, which I'll, I'll use the label sustainability for the moment for, but th there are other ways of talking about it, is coming into the mainstream. And anyone who has been at one of these points, this happens to be in Brazil, uh, on the Amazon, but where, where two different rivers come together, will know that for miles downstream, there are these extraordinary vortices or pa patterns of um, turbulence. Uh, and I think this is where we are, that as this agenda, this change agenda comes into the mainstream, that turbulence can only build. And that's partly what is making this uh, much more political uh, than it was, as is the speed of uh, and the pace of uh, new technologies uh, coming into this um, economy of ours. I mean, I, I, for, I've, I've mentioned in previous uh, Future of Capitalism sessions that I, I worked with Ford uh, for a number of years at the beginning of this century uh, and saw uh, Elon Musk in peripheral vision. This was 2003, 2004, and said to people at Ford, um, that's interesting because I think electric uh, mobility is the, the shape of the future. It's where we're going to be headed. And I remember some of the engineers, not just in Ford, elsewhere in Detroit too, saying to me, yeah, we tried it. We tried electric cars 100 years ago. It didn't work then. It, it's not going to work now. And so it, it's not just um, renewable energy. It's not just battery technology. It's not just autonomous vehicles. It's not just sort of uh, precision fermentation and synthetic biology. There are many more technologies that are going up this sort of curve than at any time uh, in our species uh, history. And what you're starting to see is a structural response from companies. So for example, I mentioned Ford. Uh, I remember talking to Bill Ford um, 20 years ago uh, and him saying, under no circumstances would Ford ever uh, split up into component businesses. Well, they've just done that. They split the business in two. There's a legacy business, which is doing internal combustion engines. There's a new part of the business that is doing uh, electric uh, vehicles. We'll see how that plays through. And they're not the only one. So Solvay in Europe, for example, has also split the business uh, into one part doing the old uh, sort of chemistry uh, and the other part doing the new part, playing into the electrification, light weighting and sustainable mobility. Uh, stories. And it's interesting in the case of uh, Solvate to see that the new part of the business is already bigger uh, than the legacy part. So when we talk about tomorrow's capitalism, we're talking about these sorts of increasingly structural uh, responses. And this was a um, conference we did just uh, 
about a month before um, uh, COVID hit, uh, in the uh, headquarters building of Aviva, a very large financial institution uh, based in London. I won't read out the message on, on the, the uh, wall, but uh, some people saw it as slightly impolite. Uh, some saw it as provocative. But I think it's a message that we all have to take uh, to heart now. We really are going to all have to step up. Um, as was kindly mentioned uh, earlier on, the triple bottom line was one of the things that I, I, I did a long time ago in 1994. Uh, the cartoon was away uh, a couple of years prior to that, in which I, I, I tried to um, explain what we were talking about, bringing very different value sets into board level and other uh, deliberations uh, in the world of business and finance and so on. In, two, in 2018, I did something that apparently had never been done before, which is to recall, do a product recall of the triple bottom line um, through the Harvard Business Review. It was them who told me that it was the first time it had ever been done. Um, some people were horrified, uh, particularly funnily enough in Brazil, um, uh, and said, how dare you? Um, because they thought a product recall was basically the end of the story. I'd worked with companies like Ford, as I said, Volvo, Toyota, and so on. And I knew what a product recall is or, or uh, should be, which is you've got a perfectly functional product that is misfiring in some way. You pull it back from the market, you fix it, and you put it back onto the road in the case of cars. And that's very much what I had in mind uh, with the triple bottom uh, line. And I've just finished my latest book, which is uh, my 21st as it happened, where I've looked back over the 70 years of my life, the 50 years of um, my professional engagement uh, in this space. Um, and what I'm basically concluding towards the end of that book is we're seeing all sorts of cycles going through our um, societies, going through our economies, and what I, I won't go through the, the, the diagram in any great detail, but simply to say, if you look at wave six, uh, which is the middle um, uh, line in the sort of medium color of gray, that's around <clears throat> ESG and right, social and governance. governance. Um, let me just take a break. So it's around ESG and it's around impact. And that, that, that is where we're going to focus uh, in a moment. But underlying all of this, I think, behind the noise, behind the clutter, there is a, something much deeper going on, which is that the paradigm, the fundamental scientific paradigm, the fundamental market paradigm is shifting. And one of the things I learned very early in my life when I read a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions is that paradigm shifts take about 70 to 80 years and I think this one started in the late 50s, early 60s. It's really getting into its stride. And the next 10 to 15 years, we'll see the pace of evolution uh, accelerating very considerably. And that will bring political uh, shockwaves, economic shockwaves, uh, social shockwaves, and so on, on a scale which we're not really used to dealing uh, with. Now, one of the responses you see in the business world is chief sustainability officers being appointed. And the very fact that Mattel, the toy company, now has a Barbie uh, version of the chief sustainability officer. She's wearing pink uh, on the left, uh, various other uh, sort of roles that young women can, can play in this sort of emerging uh, economy um, are also uh, shown. So some people, uh, Kate Brandt, who's the chief sustainability officer um, at Google, did a tweet around uh, the launch of these uh, dolls. I, I, I with uh, jokingly replied, my job is done. My job is do not done. Your job is not done. Uh, we've, we're just getting started uh, in this process. And that was born, born in on me uh, in Davos, uh, beginning of this year, during the World Economic Forum event. Uh, I was, I'd been a judge on the first ever uh, uh, award scheme for chief sustainability officers globally. Um, and I couldn't get there, so I did a video ahead of time. And the question I asked in the video was, have we reached peak chief sustainability officer, peak CSO? And my answer was, 
Absolutely not. Uh, we're going to see many more companies moving in that direction. Uh, and some of those people will be excellent. Some of them would do, do great work. But will this solve our fundamental problems? I really do not uh, think so. Part of the reason for that, and I was talking to a chief sustainability officer from an accounting company yesterday, and she was talking about what work her team, which is quite a big team, uh, is now doing. And a lot of it is on sustainability reporting. So you see in the chart, um, based on KPMG uh, analysis, the way in which the, the percentage of major companies around the world reporting in this sort of way has grown. And the recent launch of the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive can only drive that faster and hopefully further. My question, though, here is, are we spending too much time on the supply side, trying to get this sort of data, this information, this intelligence produced, and too little on the demand side? Who's actually using this uh, information in order to drive system change in the way that we now need to see it uh, happening? And I think there's a lot of work to be done on that side. And I think AI, artificial intelligence, will be part of that story. And this was just a... a, a, a um, a report that came out from BCG and the uh, World Economic Forum. And the chart on the left shows why I think so many people are now beginning to conclude that what we've been doing to date simply will not be enough to change the, uh, well, to address the challenges that we're currently uh, dealing with. And, and most of the trajectories that we currently see people embarking on, even the leadership companies, are nothing like that green uh, trajectory, which we would need to uh, adopt to get back onto a 1.5 degree centigrade path. Now, all of that sounds quite um, not negative, but I mean, it, 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 it's there are certainly a lot of dark clouds out there. I oddly feel more optimistic now than I have done at any time in the last 15 to 20 years. And the reason is, I think that the old order that we've all grown up with, that we've taken for granted, geopolitical, macroeconomic, and so on, is starting to come apart. Uh, and when people think they know what they're doing, they're quite resistant to having anyone else tell them how to run their business or how to think or whatever. Once things start to wobble, that can change. This is, a, this is a diagram which some of you will have seen uh, done by Ramas Nam, who's an energy analyst. He also happens to be an excellent science fiction uh, author. And it's interesting because he, he started to put these extra extraordinarily radical charts together showing how he thought the price of, in this case, solar, but wind, battery, EVs, electric vehicles, and so on would, would, would um, uh, collapse. And each time he's put these charts together, he finds that the actual, the reality has uh, out accelerated uh, his predictions. So that's that's part of the good story. Um, a slightly less comfortable story is when you look at how boards within major companies are addressing these sorts of issues, um, it's about half, half of the uh, people in a recent survey, NCAD and BCG again, um, basically saying that their, their boards are really not yet uh, properly up to speed on all of this. So still, again, a huge amount of work to be done. Let me just very quickly touch on the political aspects of all of this. I think, I think this is a really crucial uh, message. How extraordinary it is to see Antonio Guterres uh, as Secretary General of the United Nations saying things like this. I'm not going to read them out, but I mean, basically... These are politically charged uh, statements from a global leader who is, by the very nature of his role, not to say, not meant to be saying things uh, like this. And yet he has concluded that these things have to be uh, said. At the same time, you've got um, the, uh, the, the, the challenges that are building around the sort of geopolitical tensions around all of this. I, I, I've worked quite a lot over the years in China, I found levels of um, nationalism there, which I, I haven't even found uh, at, at, in, in Japan. And that has worried uh, me considerably. And I was once in China when they shot down one of their own 
satellites put 3,400 pieces of debris into space orbit, but were very excited about their ability to knock down other people's uh, spy satellites and so on. I was also in China when they um, they they cut off rare earth mineral uh, exports uh, to Japan for a week. Some of you may actually remember that. And so I think there is an underlying pattern building here, which is that while we might hope that China would be a very powerful exporter of cheap green technology, it will be playing other games at the same time. And we see the friendly moments in all of this. But one of the reasons why uh, Joe Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act uh, into uh, law was because he saw China outcompeting uh, the United States. So this is becoming mainstream. It is becoming uh, political. And in places like Europe, whether it's heat, heat pumps in Germany, whether it's farmers uh, across uh, Europe, you're getting pushback. Now, you, and it, the, the, the sort of the green agenda is being, and climate agenda and so on is being picked up by uh, right-wing parties. Will this end? No, I don't think it will. I think this is something that is going to be increasingly a characteristic of the agenda that companies are going to have to deal with. And business leaders in leadership companies are going to have to pay much more attention to this than they have done to date. This is an extraordinary year. You all know it. Uh, 2024, we'll see um, countries with uh, over 4 billion people uh, going to the polls, uh, uh, democracy struggling to uh, be effective, uh, 2 billion voters involved in that. Um, my personal view is even if Donald Trump does not get in back into power in the United States, um, we're going to see something of a sustainability uh, recession. We've already seen an ESG uh, recession because of the pushback from uh, Republicans in the United States, but many other people in, in other parts of the world. A sustainability recession would not be a bad thing. I should just underscore that point, because it, the, in these recessionary periods, these downturns, people start to think and rethink. And I think that's uh, it's a good time to do that. Now, I'm immensely excited about uh, trends like the growth in numbers of B corporations around the world. Hopefully, most of you know what B corporations are. We were the first B Corp in uh, the UK. We incubated B Lab UK for about nine months before they uh, found their own feet. I love this movement, but it's only 8,000 companies, and they're typically uh, not really big ones. There's some exceptions, but most of them are not. So what do we do now to go, try and get some of the bigger companies uh, involved and, and starting to drive uh, the necessary um, policy level action and to some degree uh, related politics? Well, one of the things that we've been doing at Valance is, is uh, working with Unilever, which is a long history of being sort of um, thoughtful on, on some of these uh, issues. And they've just done their first ever uh, review of their memberships of trade and industry federations. And then what we've done for them is to compare uh, the um, climate strategies and policies um, and lobbying of these different associations and federations with the declared public statements that Unilever has made around uh, climate. And about a quarter of the memberships turn out to be really suspect. Now, the next question is, will Unilever then start to resign, put pressure, political pressure on some of these uh, industry associations? It's not just Unilever. You see people like Covestro, Bayer in Germany. You see Microsoft uh, in the United States beginning to do similar reviews. I think this is an early stage of this political uh, game. Let me just towards a conclusion and, 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 and uh, before opening it up to... Um, discussion, just say a little bit about where I think impact uh, fits into all of this. Um, some quite big numbers have been given for different types of both positive and negative uh, impact. This was true cost a number of years ago, now part of um, Standard & Poor's, but basically looking at environmental damage in this case and, and putting multi-trillion uh, price tags on that multi-trillion uh, dollar price, price tags. I think over time, we're going to see a lot more of that sort of uh, accounting for uh, negative impact and, and 
people trying to put this on the uh, the radar screens of politicians, but maybe major companies as well. And about three or four years, three or four weeks ago, I was in Paris with Ecovades. Some of you will know them. Uh, I've been involved with them since 2007, when they were about five or six people. Uh, they're now 1,700 and still growing. Uh, and when I first joined, they were tracking a few dozens of um, companies around the world. They now track over 130,000 uh, businesses. The reason why I'm going through all of this is that what you're seeing is an opening up of supply chains as these sorts of platforms start to get a grip on the social, the environmental, the human rights, and so on, footprints and performance of, of, of uh, businesses uh, around the world. But it, it's, it's quite a challenging time for uh, these platforms because we're also going into a period of, I believe, of deglobalization. Doesn't mean total deglobalization, but it does mean that that sort of uh, rampant uh, period of, of globalization that saw companies like Shell and Nike and Monsanto get into such problems. Uh, that is starting to go into reverse, and we can discuss what the implications of that will be. One of the things that we're starting to see is the generational politics playing out within companies. So, for example, uh, I've used this case before in the Future of Capitalism uh, a series of, uh, of uh, events. But Acciona is a Spanish uh, infrastructure and energy company. Uh, they brought us in to, uh, uh, to work with 27 of their fast track uh, executives. The, the, the brief was, give us a five-year sustainability strategy. At the end of the process, the, 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 these fast track people basically said, no, we're going to do a 10-year framework because this is longer than just five years. And it's not going to be just sustainability. It's going to be for the group as a whole. Uh, and the tagline that they adopted at that time was regenerative uh, by design, um, which sounds nice to have, but we've visited some of the projects uh, that Akthione are working on. This one, particular one happens to be Line 6, the subway system in Sao Paulo. Uh, we went right the way through the, the tunnels that are still being dug as we went into them. And again, the, 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 the social and the environmental aspect of their regeneration story is very, very striking. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that gives me a sense of optimism. Towards a conclusion, I think when I look back over my working life, I think when we started uh, the environmental movement, the sustainability industry, almost as it now is, we, we were interested in materials and products. Uh, we, were, we were interested in projects and environmental impact assessments of those. We then became interested in all sorts of different uh, industrial processes and so on. Uh, it, the product perspective opened up and went into sort of more complicated uh, products and certainly with the new technologies that are coming through electric vehicles and so on, um, that continues. It then sort of went into business models. I mean, for a long time, it was, let's ha have a look at the business case for considering impact or whatever it might be. And then the question came, and particularly around the new economy period and after that, how do we create new business models that deliver the right sort of positive impact or the balance of positive and negative impact and are profitable in the process. And where I think we're now headed uh, is a systemic focus. People increasingly uh, concerned, which is where we started Volans uh, back in 2008 to look at system change. I think that is also going mainstream. Recent launch in Brussels of the uh, Systems Transformation Hub, all sorts of system change players starting to come into the same uh, place to put their bring their um, resources together. One of the one of the areas, if I just go back to value creation, um, that I think is really exciting, is to see a small but growing number of economists uh, play beginning to pay growing attention to how value might be assessed over time. Kate Rayworth on the left there with uh, Donut Economics, Mariana Mazzucato on the right. If you haven't come across their work, I recommend it very highly. As I do Pavan Sukdev's uh, work, you will know of other people working in this sort of space. But I think economics 
is beginning to pay attention, wake up, uh, and hopefully uh, evolve. AI, I think, will have a very major uh, um, impact or, or um, effect in this sort of space. Most of most of the media attention you get is it tends to be around the negative consequences, loss of jobs and employment opportunities, and so on. I, I think we will get through that and AI will actually have some amazingly useful applications in uh, the sustainability space. This is pretty much my last slide and it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to capture what we think is going on in this space uh, at the moment. There are three horizons, three curves here. The one that starts on the left at the top, the purple line, is um, the world in which we've all grown up, the world that we largely take for granted. I won't go through all of the uh, different points there, but th those have been developed in working with a range of different leadership companies as, as we went through various processes. But you'll notice that under that now heading, you have shareholder primacy. And so the Boeing case study is an example of what can go really wrong if that sort of uh, agenda of shareholder primacy that uh, gets out of control. All three horizons in, in today's world uh, at, at the same time, the middle one, the, the sort of orangey line, that's a world in which resilience becomes very much more important. R responsibility is really important in the, the first uh, agenda, and that's where a lot of the focus has been. Resilience starts to become much more of an issue as businesses, as supply chains, as economies start to wobble because of the, uh, the sorts of uh, challenges that I started off by uh, talking about. And at the bottom, you have that dark blue line, uh, which is on the edges of today's system. It's, it's building out of sight, out of mind. Some of it has to do with technology. Some of it has to do with new business models or, or new financial models. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with new mindsets and fundamentally a different paradigm, a different understanding based on science on what markets should be delivering by way of value. And uh, one of the areas that I, I, I um, spend a lot of time uh, digging into is science fiction. And one of the things that's really striking at the moment is the way in which science fiction uh, as, as a sort of class of, of, of literature has really taken on uh, the sorts of challenges that we're talking about here uh, today. Some people would prefer to call it speculative uh, fiction, people like David Brin. Uh, but it's, it's it immensely uh, interesting to see how people are starting to play this through and saying, what if, where does all of this uh, take us uh, over time? And if you haven't read uh, some of these, for example, Ministry of, for the Future, I recommend very highly, although it's slightly like a novelized MBA uh, thesis in, in some parts. Some of the others are, are rather be better written. But if you really want a sense of where uh, value creation is going to go, where the impact story is going to go, uh, I recommend those very highly. This is the last uh, and rather impolite uh, slide, and it goes back to where I started, uh, which is to say that uh, at least in my personal experience, and I've been teaching at business schools for about 35 years now, they've been very slow to pick up on the sorts of things that we're talking about uh, today. The individual faculty members have, have um, uh, done good work. Groups of students have done good work. But I see the Future of Capitalism Alliance or coalition of different business schools as one of the most uh, exciting indications that the business schools are, are really beginning to take this uh, really seriously. And by God, we need them. We really need um, the sort of thinking that they can uh, bring uh, to bear. And we need to get the next generation of uh, business leaders uh, trained up on all of this. Now, before I uh, hand over to Sonia, hopefully, um, maybe I could just come out of this uh, slide presentation. And again, apologies for the... Uh, slow start to all of this, but um, just to see if there are any questions or comments that people might have or areas that they want a little bit more detail on. 
Lawrence, can I hand that back to you to, to steer us okay. on? Okay. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Maybe let's have some face-to-face uh, -face on screen uh, questioning while the content is still fresh. And then later on, we bring in Sonia Hot. And then uh, after that, we can still have a collective uh, discussion among everybody. Yes, I can see one hand already. Bill Hearn. I can see two. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Professor John, for the, the lecture. Um, well, in, in your point of view, uh, what role do you believe emerging technologies uh, such as uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain can play in driving sustainable developments and yeah. fostering more transparent and accountable business practices in the perspective of the, the future of the capitalism? Thank you. Thank you, Guilherme. And, 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 and I think if, if it were not for the new technologies that are starting to come through, I would be a lot less optimistic than I currently am, because I think they bring potential improvements uh, in you know, sort of the, the impact, negative impact per unit of production, which are, are spectacular, at least potentially. I, I have in, in previous sessions mentioned a group based in Silicon Valley and in the UK called Rethink X, Rethink X. So if you haven't come across them, um, and this is to the, the audience as a whole, I really recommend their work because they've looked at transportation mobility, they've looked at energy, they've looked at food production in the future, things like um, precision fer fermentation and synthetic biology and so on. And they, they're looking at the scale of the impacts that some of these technologies will have. So just take one example. They looked at the uh, food production, and particularly the cattle uh, and dairying industry in the United States into the 2030s. And they reckon that if once uh, critical, uh, the fact is you can produce uh, milk, you can produce um, meat, you can produce leather in fermentation processes. Um, so over a period of time, we expect more of that to happen. Very often you get the hype cycle. So in the, the early days, people promise a lot, nothing very much happens. And then badoom, over time, they come through much more powerfully. But the, but the conclusion towards the end of that particular report from Rethink X was that something like 60% of the animals on American farms would disappear by the 2040s. And the reason was that they would no longer be necessary. If you think about a, uh, a, a sector of the American economy, which is often the farmers are, are clinging on by their fingernails, we might say. I mean, it's, it, the, the margins are often very um, low. You think about that sort of scale of change, uh, several things are gonna happen. One is a huge consolidation uh, in the industry. So much bigger players coming in. Um, a rewilding of uh, much of the landscape because there may well be people saying, let's, let's uh, recognize carbon capture and storage value in natural ecosystems and in soils, and let's rebuild the health of these uh, once farmed ecosystems. And that's a new asset class. Let's invest in that over time. But if you think about also, you know, what was put people like Trump in power, it's been the, the, the deep sense of uncertainty in populations of industrial workers, uh, increasingly in, in, in the farming communities. Uh, and so these changes are going to happen, whether we like them or not. The question is, will governments play their role? And Mariana Mazzucato, part of what she does is to talk about the way in which governments can and must play this sort of role, steering role, guiding role, um, systemically. Um, so to your question, I, I, I think AI, just to take one more example, um, is showing us some, some uh, perfect illustrations in some ways of what goes wrong if you allow one class of society, one set of society to code the future. So, you know, you, the early examples were things like um, uh, monitoring systems that couldn't recognize black faces because the people who did the coding 
were white and young men uh, almost exclusively. So I, I worry that uh, if you get the wrong people doing the coding, and if you look at, uh, with the greatest of respect of China and, and what's happening there with the surveillance uh, systems, use of camera systems of AI and so on, facial recognition and all the rest of it, and that's about to be exported. It already is being exported to different parts of the world. Um, there are there are consequences that will come from AI, which we're not yet properly uh, thinking through. You get science fiction authors that are thinking about it. You get campaigning groups that are thinking about it, but governments are not yet uh, because governments aren't thinking about it because they see there's a competitive race. That, you know, it, either China's going to win or India's going to win or we're going to win or whatever it, is, it happens to be. So I, I, I just to go back where I started. I'm optimistic because I think these new technologies have immense power. They're all, all digital, which means that they're all scalable at an exponential rate, which wasn't true with, you know, iron and steel and chemistry and and and, and, and even aerospace. Um, so I think I think the potential is huge. But just final point, as I visit, I, I, just because I'm interested, I, I, I get in touch with some of these companies, for example, like DeepMind, before they were acquired by Google, I got in touch with them and said, I just, I just want to talk to some of your coders, I want to talk to some of your analysts, I want to talk to some of you people who are directing the business to find out what you think you're driving towards. It was fascinating. And I, I've done it with other HP and other, other companies as well. It was fascinating because the younger people, it goes back to my generational point, totally understand sustainability, really want their businesses to be driving in that direction. Uh, but their brains work at about 15 times the pace, the speed that my brain works at. Um, and you know, I, I would love to be closer into some of these things. But the thing that really shocked me and it goes back to your 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 question, Gulambi, which was, I asked them, who do you see from the ESG, the sustainability world? Who, who's coming to see you? Who's, who's paying attention to what you're doing? And the answer, almost no one. It's because I think what's happened is that the sustainability industry is still largely focused on you know, the cars, the planes, the, all the stuff that's already at scale and causing a lot of problems. Uh, and then what, then what we're not yet properly doing is addressing uh, these emergent technologies and getting in now when you can still have quite a big um, uh, influence. So it's quite a long answer to to uh, question, but it's it's something that's really um, agitating me. So if anyone on the, on this um, uh, th 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 this call is sort of working in that area in any way at all. I would be very interested to hear from you. And my, my email, incidentally, is john at valance.com. So, and I respond to every email. Thank you, Gulomi. I mean, I, I continue very Thank happy you. to continue the conversation afterwards. But okay. I still have okay. Maybe let's have uh, three quick questions and yeah. uh, answers. And then after that, we immediately we come to Sonia. And all Thank other me. questions, we can do it together after Sonia has spoken. So let's have Marcelo a quick question and maybe a quick answer. Uh, hi, thank you very much, Mr. Acton, for your presentation. Uh, so I'm from Brazil, and right now we have a big discussion here about electric cars. Yeah. My question, my question is, I, I've seen a lot of a lot of people saying that uh, electric cars does uh, doesn't have the the positive impact that should be should have because of uh, the negative impact you have to produce the batteries. And later on, when the battery is not chargeable anymore, you got to discard this battery. And you're also going to have an impact on the environment. I just want to know uh, how true is this uh, to see if, if really, really electric cars is the future. It's a great question. The simple answer is electric mobility, electric vehicles are the future. Uh, the, the level of the technology that we currently have, including battery technology, is not yet sufficiently well uh, developed to get us to where we need to be. I, I bought a, I, I, in, in London, we have air quality controls, uh, certain types of vehicle you can no longer use. I think that's a good thing. We had a, an old 20 year old Volvo. We got rid of it. Uh, we went for two years without a car. But then I bought a Tesla Model Y because I wanted to experiment 
uh, with electric vehicles. In the part of London where we live, there are, mul there are many charging points where you can get renewable energy uh, charging into, in, in, into your car. The problem is a structural one, that what's happening in many countries, and I think Brazil is, is, is in some ways almost worse, that, that, that the, the country is so big that getting that charging infrastructure out when you've already got, uh, you know, the sort of the diesel and, and the gasoline um, uh, refilling uh, infrastructure out there is really problematic. So the the I think the, the electrification of mobility will happen fastest in major cities, uh, and it will then spread much more slowly out to uh, the rural uh, regions. Um, hybrid vehicles may be a sort of part way uh, solution. But but again, just to loop back, I think they, electric mobility and vehicles are the solution. I think governments have to be much more involved in making sure that the infrastructure is there. Because the problem is at the moment, very often the infrastructure is going into areas like the one I live in, in London, which is relatively wealthy. Uh, so you get the renewable energy <laughs> recharging potential whereas you don't get in other parts of the country this this has to be rolled out in a much more uh, systemic uh, way but don't let the fossil fuels companies and don't let the automotive companies uh, persuade you that electric vehicles are a mistake uh, they're not and the thing is they're evolving very very rapidly okay thank you Excellent. john mobility let's now move to but yes but uh, thank you much for your inspiring uh, speech. I, I liked very much your conclusion at the end when you said we move from products towards resilience business models towards systemic uh, change. My question to you is, is what do you expect now regarding this systemic change and that EU systems transformation hub you were referring to? Is it like a new green deal? that needs to come or what is your personal expectation uh, about uh, this new uh, this systemic change it's a great question again and 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 the answer about is 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 um it comes in several pieces one is that it's easy to talk about system or systemic change it's a very different uh, uh challenge to work out what that actually means and how that might then be delivered i mentioned economics uh, I think economics is one of our fundamental problems. I think the way that we calculate uh, value and we calculate wealth and so on is fundamentally flawed and, and, and needs to be addressed, which is why I see what people like Kate and Mariana are doing as, 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 as useful progress in the right direction. But our legal structures uh, 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 need definition. Just today, I saw that uh, a group of Swiss in Switzerland, older women... Uh, had successfully sued the Swiss government uh, uh, for human rights abuse because they said they're older people who suffer much more from heat stress in warm summers. And so they went to the European Court for Human Rights and won that case, which means a lot of pressure is going to be pushed, put on the Swiss government. So the legal structures need to be uh, changed uh, as well. Um, I think your point about the, the, the Green Deals, they're really important, but the, at the moment they're being put together very rapidly in response to lots of different uh, pressures. And the danger is that they, they start to push us off. People start to feed on the subsidies that are going through these sort of Green Deal structures. And I think they need to be much more transparent. The people behind this need to be much more Accountable. The European Union has just done raids, uh, police raids on in Italy, where something like six hundred million euros of funding had actually been diverted from what it should actually be doing. So it, I'm excited that the Inflation Reduction Act exists. I'm like uh, uh, the similar things are happening in other parts of the world, but I we we've really got to pay attention and not assume that these things are going to go in the right direction. The, it, the, finally, the, the, the probably the biggest and most important element of system change is education. And I hear too many people now saying, we don't have time to educate people. We've got to do it now. And I think the single most important investment that any society makes 
is in education. And we should be educating not just young people now, and I just remember what I said about business schools, we should be educating every age group and we should be re-educating people at my level because, or my age, because you know we think we know how the world works and we've actually been brought up uh, to understand a very different set of system dynamics. So we ourselves need our brains retuning. Uh, that sounds a bit. That sounds a bit sort of communist or whatever. But but I I mean it. I think education is crucial in all of it. But thanks for the question. Thank thank you, John. Yes, we have time for education. We have time for one more question before the next speaker, Pedro. Yes, yes time for you. Yes, thank you for your for your vision. Uh, my moral of your story is thanks for the liberal system that we have. Thanks for capitalism that allow people like you to go out to the market of ideas and win the fights or win and live. So I don't see anything in the capitalist system that won't allow people like you and people that have a different view to be gaining in this day. So my, that's my moral. Thanks that we live in a liberal democracy and the capitalist system bottoms up where all this idea can, we can interact and the winners we will see who is but we are changing thanks to that. Pedro, I completely agree. I think democracy and capitalism are incredibly messy and incredibly dangerous if they're in the wrong hands. But as as, as Winston Churchill once said, you know, that they're, they're, they're not the they're, they're worst of all possible worlds except the alternatives. So, I mean, thank God for liberal democracy. Or not thank God, let, let's thank the people who put it together. Okay. Thank you, John. I think uh, this is actually a good juncture for us to move on to our next speaker and then we'll continue our conversation and John later on can, of course, come back in. I'm very happy now to uh, bring in and introduce our next speaker uh, who is actually introduced by John himself. Uh, her name is Sonia Hort and she you can recognize her. She's wearing green tonight and Sonia is actually head of Impact Valuation at Novartis, which is a very famous Swiss multinational pharmaceutical. Uh, beside being a specialist in impact, uh, I think Sonia has a very illustrious history in Aspen Institute, WEF, World Economic Forum, Global Future Councils. She's a very prolific author. And one thing very interesting about Sonia, besides having an MBA, uh, she has uh, one of her degrees in physics. Maybe that's why she's so good in impact analysis because of the <laughs> physics background. Sonia, it's all yours. <laughs> uh, unmute yourself, yes. Uh, unmute your button. Thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. So here's the the thing on. Uh, so I don't think that I don't hope it takes uh, studying physics to get to make some first rights with impact valuation. And nonetheless, I think uh, so. Let me see whether I can indeed share this screen with the presentation. Um. So, so if I go into presentation mode, I fear I lose you all. <laughs> uh, let me check. Is there a presentation coming through on your sites? Yes, the presentation is coming through, but it's it's showing. It's like it was with me. The all the slides are showing, or some hmm. select the slides. Yeah. Can you click on the, the presentation mode at the bottom there? Yes, I am in presentation mode. I was trying to share the I was trying to share this the, the window. Yeah. Um hoping that I could sort of uh, see you too. <laughs> but if I do the entire screen, let me see whether this is actually working. doesn't let me do that. It doesn't let me share the full screen. 
maybe now. How's that? That's working. Okay, then then let me work with what's working. Um, but I am admittedly flying blind, so I just see the presentation now. So any um, comments, nonverbal ones in the chat will be uh, unfortunately ignored for the beginning. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you, John, for your kind words of introduction. Thank you, Lawrence, for introducing me too. And it's fascinating that there's an entire session on the future of capitalism, which I believe is absolutely urgently required that we discuss these things. I'd like to even step back a bit more and discuss why metrics at all, then delve into the question of why impact of all measurement options and then how impact is becoming impact accounting and how that potentially adds up to an impact economy. And then we already heard from John step up or get out of the way, so there are implications for leadership. <clears throat> so why metrics? I'd like to approach this through uh, a number of quotes that I find neatly uh, explain the space. So the first one, Yogi Berra, a baseball player. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. Or by Dale Kennedy, who starts out going nowhere, generally gets there uh, slightly less positive and less tongue-in-cheek. But in business, generally, orientation to where the business is headed comes through measurements in expressed in objectives and then in targets and all of these performance measures are typically traced. Now, uh, it shouldn't be self-serving. Instead, that those data points should be carriers of information and there should be insights derived from that. And now, ideally, this implies that metrics, as you know, as you've probably discussed in this course, uh, should help drive strategy, direction, improvements. They should provide focus, priorities, uh, help us uh, allocate resources in accordance to strategy. They should inform the business not only where it is right now, but where it's headed, where it's off, and so forth. So uh, here, um, I, I'd like to, to turn this um, to a, a less known uh, quote and how, on, on how the famous what gets managed gets done. Um, continues. So Peter Drucker said that, and and I guess it's it's a quote that every business school student has heard at least once. And he actually went on to say that what gets measured gets done or managed, even <clears throat> if that's at the detriment of the organization and goes against its purpose. So um, what I what I'd like to bring across here is that metrics are the mirror of business performance, and like in a mirror, what you see is pretty much dependent on who looks into it with which eyes. So what the actual or factual purpose is will deliver a, a view on what it is that you see in terms of performance management. So um, without, I, I know that, or I expect that you discussed notions of corporate purpose in, in this session before, but um, there is a notion that we need to ask on long-term value creation. <clears throat> so there's a highly subjective element to this. And this subjectivity uh, rarely comes out, but um, it has done so in the uh, Schroeder Wealth Management, where they consult with family businesses on their impact investing approaches. And here, I, I was quite intrigued that they start off with articulating purpose for them. So what, what are what are important values for these groups of people who have enough money to spend to decide on investment strategies? And if you look, look through the list, it's too small here to read it all, but there are topics like adventure, friendship, health, legacy, self-respect, trust, things that one maybe doesn't classically associate with the notion of investment. So these clarity on values will help inform the investment strategies. A more maybe down-to-earth uh, approach on how to translate purpose and strategy into metrics has been put forth by the Embankment Project for Inclusive Capitalism, where there's a structure and also tools on how to work through that process on having an overarching purpose statement and then 
derives metrics. Um, irrespective of framework and processes and tools, there is a judgment required uh, underlying that. It is a value judgment. If we like it or not, whatever decision is taken, there is a value judgment underlying that. And, and maybe um, one way of, of illustrating that is if we think long term, depending on whether one considers life expectancies or new cycles or retirement ages, uh, what's long, long term differs quite a bit. What's for certain, though, is that in long term value creation, notions of value and values are joined. And um, uh, I, I'd like to highlight Colin Mayer's phrase on businesses create value by producing profitable solutions for the problems of people and the planet, not by profiting from creating problems. And uh, I, I guess while this is very pointedly formulated, <clears throat> it's um, not the reality of capitalism today. However, uh, what values are and how they're translated into performance metrics is not ironclad. We just had that uh, emerging conversation on how capitalism was formed by humans. Uh, the underlying values reflected what mattered as main priorities to them back then and there. Um, at the same time, if these things are shifting, we can adjust capitalism to reflect our new priorities. Um, in addition to what we heard from John, maybe three points of evidence on this one in, is that the uh, impact investing market has grown from in existence some seven years back to uh, no, well above a trillion um, assets under management, quite, quite considerable growth rate in just a few years. Then uh, you may have picked up on the notion of conscious quitting uh, uh, a phrase coined by Paul Pullman to actually express that uh, employees have started uh, increasingly to leave companies if they feel that their own values do not coincide with the value of the corporation. And then um, even on the consumer level for the US, there's a McKinsey study showing that uh, consumers are, are prepared to back up uh, sustainable consumption choices with their wallets. And uh, I guess some of the uh, assessments that RethinkX have performed point into the same direction. Now, um, long-term value creation is highly subjective, as, as mentioned. Um, uh, John, I just can't help <laughs> uh, thinking of that uh, King Lear quote, uh, so Shakespeare, uh, a kingdom for a horse. So so some people are at that desperate that they would get anything and everything for just um, a, a very small benefit. So... <clears throat> Taking all of these things together uh, leaves us, brings us to the fact that uh, metrics, as objectively we want them to be, are in their nature derived from a from a judgment. So uh, one should have a strategic choice around them. One should be deliberate. But um, uh, but in, as a matter of fact, often it depends on the um, shortcut framing that is chosen. So. In reality, metrics are often not derived by deliberate strategy, but come from where there's data, what other companies do, and uh, what the company in question has done in the past. So this is not really driven by strategic choice or intended strategy, but is more a version of, uh, allow me to say, uh, random choice. Now, um, with what we know about metrics and how they guide focus, the question really is how can random metrics deliver anything else but random results? So while um, metrics um, depend on value and values, of course, but the question is really if we, if, 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 if there's differences in the value judgment, uh, but there should be at least for a company enough clarity to have a plan, to have a plan and a consistent approach instead of choose any random metrics. So um, shortly said, plan beats no plan 
So the choices on the metrics for performance should be as deliberate as, deliberate, as strategic as ever possible. What um, John described in terms of megatrends, upheavals, uh, supply disruptions, the need for resilience, has actually been referred to, and uh, again, another phrase that I believe you must have heard in your studies, as, as the VUCA world where business ecosystems are exposed to volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous situations. So uh, would you need more or less clarity, more and less of a North Star in such a world? I guess you need more adequately selected, more deliberately chosen metrics, and you need more, uh, more uh, an, 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 an expression of performance that is more in line with your corporate purpose. In short, we need impact metrics. Impact has been defined as a change in one or more dimensions of people's well-being directly or indirectly through a change in the condition of the natural environment. And here's the thing, an impact can be actual or potential, intended or unintended, positive or negative. And I think that's the main differentiator to many of the sustainability metric offerings where often one is just looking for positive stories whereas impact is looking at the entire spectrum of these positive and negative unintended and intended impacts <clears throat> impact measurement goes beyond traditional reporting which typically traces inputs or outputs so what have we invested in something what have we spent on something outputs was well how many volumes of a certain products have we issued but instead traced longer term effects of that business activity on what has changed to a stakeholder due to that business activity the evaluation then uh, comes from the uh, the need to pot possibly compare impact drivers across impact dimensions and not leave them there standing there in isolation so um Impact metrics have the opportunity, provide the, the, the opportunity to actually deliver impact by intention and design as opposed to leaving things on the level of random choice. So um, what people feedback and what actually was one of the drivers for me to write the book on impact evaluation is that it makes intuitively sense. Why would you not care about your stakeholders as a, as a as say as a startup you need to be mindful of your employees your your bank certainly your first customers else you simply don't have a business now this is also true for larger corporations and in the book the case for impact i uh, i hone in on seven business drivers for impact and i'd like to go through them very quickly with examples <clears throat> So the first one um, is on brand differentiation and resulting sales coming from SK Group. They've been using measurement and impact valuation for years now across their conglomerate, including energy, chemicals, telecommunications, if I'm not mistaken, financial services, logistics as well. And uh, clearly say that that's a pillar of their brand differentiation and this is how they can be successful. Isai, the Japanese pharmaceutical, uh, has enjoyed uh, Ryo Yanagi as a CFO for a while. And um, he had a very clear view on what long term investment would mean for Isai. And um, so he, he demonstrated that uh, investments in certain material items like um, uh, salaries and, and wages in general, but also female leadership, uh, childcare offerings and investments in R&D are all delivering a, a positive uh, price book ratio for Isai over a five years horizon. Um, just because we talked electric cars, it's um, a, a nice one, I, I think, this example on innovation market preparation. So uh, electric cars uh, may uh, appear like an, a, a no-brain innovation nowadays. There's this uh, a case, though, from a, year, a few years back where the city of Göteborg wanted to understand by when there would be a return on investment. And, and be, be transparent on the case the transition to electric buses would 
would be for the community. So although one could think in a Scandinavian country and electric cars, you just do it, right? But even in such situations, it's beneficial to be able to articulate what actually the value creation source is. Um, yeah, uh, operational efficiency is sort of a straightforward thing. Um, if we reduce energy use, we reduce costs. So here, sustainability thinking and uh, and sustain uh, sustainability thinking and classical management thinking would coincide. Um, but there's much more to it. So in the case of PwC UK, they've um, looked more uh, more closely into that and um, were actually able to sh to uh, take measures in a way that they were decoupling their growth trajectory from their environmental impacts. And if you think it's a people business, that would be rather linear. Um, up until a certain point, uh, office needs and so forth considered <clears throat> um, would be rather linear with economic growth. Uh, it's it's quite considerable, especially because in their analysis they include the induced effects of environmental tolls of salaries and wages. That is the sort of the lifestyle um, statistically assessed of their employees. Um, to a group were trying to do an efficiency assessment, but then by looking into impact valuation discovered that they should be moving from a volume-based um, business to uh, a different way of looking at their, uh, at, at the value they're offering to their customers altogether, which is, uh, I mean, kudos to them. Not many companies make such transitions and I don't know whether it has come to them easily. Risk, another classical sustainability topic where things coincide with the trendy ESG topics. Uh, and here a, an example comes from Ambuja Cement, in the meantime, a Holcim company, uh, were looking at the fact while the cement, their melting stones, basically using lots of energy, uh, wh what types of environmental tolls the, the uh, excavation, but also the, the energy usage would carry. And uh, this has resulted in uh, the mother company, the acquiring company, company actually um, uh, adopting that approach altogether now. In terms of capital access, an example comes from Infosys, who, um, as a consulting IT consulting company, needed to. Uh, convinced their investors that investing in people makes sense. So they used impact valuation to actually demonstrate how that allows them to remain successful and um, were able to get the required valuation. Another one um, coming at, at this more on a top level was uh, the market entry of, uh, of Sondo, a generics and biosimilars company who actually made their first uh, appearance on the stock market by explaining their their sustainability story anchored in purpose and in impact, like shown on the slide here. Um, the seventh topic is one that is often overlooked. I call it theme alignment, and that's the notion of how can you get to a fact-based dialogue? How can one look at the same facts with stakeholders in the same in the same way, and I think this notion of theme alignment, alignment, do we agree on what the challenges are, what best solutions would be, goes a long way. And I think this is where it all starts and having a joint um, perspective on the challenges at hand, on what are the major drivers for this. And Natura with their cosmetics, they're the, uh, they're the owners of Body Shop. As a brand, as with their cosmetic, their integration in local communities is of course is of course super high, and they require that to actually uh, keep the alignment across employees. Um, caring um, is a long-term user of um, the environmental impact as their environmental PNL as they inherited on their side uh, from Puma. Um, they, their case is because they are such a long-standing practitioner, it's hard to say they use it for this or that. Instead, they give a whole list of what they uh, experience as benefits of impact valuation. <clears throat> 
Solvay were you were mentioned before as a company um, that split up um, their their original business in their specialty chemicals branch. They they were very soon clear that uh, some of their products are uh, come with a heavy environmental toll and uh, for those products who have that environmental toll but um, carry a, a, a beautiful margin for them it was clear that they're exposed to disruption by others by competitors so um, instead of waiting and seeing and sort of milking it out um, until that unfortunate day comes, they did that themselves. So they um, assessed their portfolio across the board, checked which would be the most vulnerable products in the first place, and then started to um, invest R&D efforts uh, to those products to replace them themselves. So they, they were disrupting themselves for higher uh, environmentally friendly uh, products, so they called it driving long-term sustainable growth in a very strategic manner. I mentioned lots of global brands. It makes sense when one speaks with a business school audience coming from all over the globe. I'd like to highlight, though, that uh, also smaller companies can benefit. And here's a tasty example from uh, from Rikes and Wheels in in Amsterdam who. Uh, actually have um, Michelin stars for those who care. Uh, and and their, their owners are very purpose-led. So for them, it was clear that beyond the, the uh, maybe superficial assessment on meat versus no meat, that they really wanted to know what uh, sustainable sourcing could look like, how they could really uh, implement sustainability strategy beyond just the superficial insights. So uh, Fritz, Klaver, Deloitte uh, worked through that with them and they uh, assessed uh, around about 1,500 ingredients, traced their, su their uh, supply path to those restaurants um, and uh, put forth an analysis for those restaurants now to work with. Now, um, yeah, uh, it's not individual examples anymore. Uh, it's it's in the meantime uh, more orchestrated than that. So uh, some of the I mentioned pioneers, early users um, of that, but in the meantime, uh, companies don't have to go through that painful way of exploratory approaches themselves. Instead, uh, they can utilize the method developed by the Value Balancing Alliance. It's a market-led um, association founded in 2019 uh, by eight companies. In the meantime, they're well above 30, including the big four consultancies as well. The idea of the impact value of the value balancing alliance was to actually harmonize impact valuation for companies, because clearly the moment you utilize such measurements, the question is how do you compare with competitors, and could one have done better, and can one bring in additional objectivity to these approaches that are that are uh, just less open to to dispute. Um, so, and in the meantime, one can clearly say this is not just a, a methodology, but it's been tested by all the participating companies in piloting rounds. <clears throat> so I, I guess this may suffice as, at this stage as an evidence for this is not just a theory, but actually highly practical. Highly practical in these uh, 14, 18 uh, indicators, depending on whether you lump together greenhouse gases, uh, air pollution um, in one, as I did here, or whether you expand this, whether you bring together work-related human rights, or whether you spell out child labor and forced labor, as one could do. But for social and human capital type topics, like uh, the social impact of wages and salaries, employee development, occupational health and safety, and so forth, environmental matters like air pollution uh, in the widest sense, um, particular matters, water, waste, land use, um, for all of these, it, there is an impact measurement approach. Economic 
dimensions are represented by the contribution of companies to GDP and the created jobs. Here, uh, it's a, 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 a link to well-established science outside sustainability. And um, uh, while there was a time when that third column of existing case studies and publications was all green and the VBA scope was lagging significantly behind. In the meantime, there's just one open point whereby they haven't covered the, the social impact of diversity, diversity and inclusion yet, but uh, promised to put forth an approach for that. So in, in summary, I'd like to uh, point to a, an article that was published by Thomson Reuters in February this year who actually summarized the movement like that, organizations that proactively embrace a comprehensive and integrated perspective on their positive and negative impacts on the world will become more resilient and competitive while setting themselves apart from competition. Setting themselves apart from competition, I'd like to briefly um, talk about impact-based narratives for the financial market. So even if one wants to tell a story just on the financial outlook, so be it on, on revenues, be it on profitability, in view of the megatrends, there can be questions on how confident one can really be in, uh, in that financial outlook. So here, impact metrics can actually help tell a more substantiated a more substantiated story. <clears throat> Similarly, by doing so, one also uh, allows investors a glance on managerial quality. So uh, proving the foresight that management has applied and uh, how um, a rigorous and granular one assesses and screens, monitors the environment for, for upcoming um, negative events, but also for opportunities uh, can be a strong point. And then, well, uh, there was a phase where sustainability claims and uh, commitments and pledges uh, were really sort of uh, in fashion. Um, at some point soon, and uh, to some extent this has already started, uh, the question is, what is the substance of these? And here uh, an, an impact statement can come in rather rather handy. And lastly, if a company defines itself along a, a clear purpose, then the question of what's the company's role in society and how, how does it contribute to close the gap to the UN SDGs may come in handy. So again, something where uh, measured and valued impact is helpful. Now, um, impact focus focuses on value to society, not on value to business. ESG, however, is working and focusing on the risk notion, risk to company um, potential um, risks and exposures due to, for example, climate change. And now uh, precisely this ESG perspective has succeeded to emerge through the various legislative, legislative, there's still one syllable too much, you know what I want to say, um, through um, and, and have turned into a, a compliance requirement. So this, then the question becomes, what does that mean for business? And I think we're on a maturity trajectory here where sustainability used to be mainly just a nice to have and one could do business as usual and add a bit of philanthropy to just show that, uh, well, one is on top of things or one is good at heart or whatever one wanted to show. And then building on that, clearly, um, businesses have uh, discovered sustainability as a reputational issue and have therefore added uh, a bit of corporate social responsibility to their philanthropic endeavors. And now with the regulatory requirements, there's a compliance element. So businesses needed to add a bit of governance on top of that. And clearly at the back of this, sustainability has also become a business for some uh, advising on compliance, on transformation to the extent that's necessary and certainly on impact investing too. So now what's certainly not yet um, established but is coming soon and has to come soon is sustainability 
as a strategy where we no longer think this apart, but really as an integrated natural element of how one does business. So such a business would be then in line with the donut economy that, uh, that John also quoted, and it would be a business thriving in the impact economy. The impact economy has been also the article, the, the rise of the impact economy has been the title of an article by the Swiss bank UBS, <clears throat> quite an insightful white paper from May last year, where they call for a paradigm shift from the output focused economy to an economy that centers around impact for all stakeholders. And um, of course, for them, it's around portfolio management. Um, but still uh, quite quite stunning that they, despite the additional complexity this takes to do impact valuation, impact accounting across a portfolio, that they took such a clear stance. So certainly there, there's movements and trends towards the impact economy on the private sector for the financial market even. Um, but I haven't touched yet on what governments actually do and and here in 2021 the um, uk-led g7 initiated the impact task force and after the presidency of the g7 has passed on um that uh, that activity that impact task force continues to work on the um, EU side of things, the Value Balancing Alliance that I mentioned before um, has actually proposed the, their environmental impact approach to the, to, um, the EU Green Deal uh, legislation. And it's, it's quoted there as a potential way of responding to these requirements. Um, yeah, so much dynamism, so many things to consider. And yet, as individuals we need to step up and get out of the way so let's um, look at what all of this means for leadership if you don't mind so i believe we come from a past where most decisions were sort of um, simple <laughs> And one could uh, utilize the Pareto principle and get straightforward answers from experts and then simply prioritize. Uh, at best, at times, things were a bit more complicated. Um, so one needed better experts and more discussions and uh, consider more things. Uh, and possibly there were multiple viable paths, but still just complicated. Now we're entering a future where complex situations may come up more and more often where cause and relationships are not entirely clear, yet you can't really stay still either. So uh, there may be situations where it's hard for management to find the right answer because there is none or anyone could actually prove to just be um, the right answer for a moment that has actually never materialized in that way. So. Um, leadership style needs to be updated according that, to that, and, and luckily resources are available um, already with a very nice article by David Snowden. <clears throat> uh, John, you had some book recommendations. I'd like to point people to uh, George Cole Reiser's Hostage at the Table. Uh, here, in all of these confusing situations where so many demands are placed, uh, one needs the North Star, one's purpose and clarity. And uh, George Kohlreiser's book on, on how to actually focus the NRI on these things and uh, keep to what matters um, to that situation um, is, is really, really valuable and uh, always worth rereading. Some an HBR article on reframing um, and it's an essential technique to reframe often we're swamped with ideas and they come with a with a certain frame and then solutions can't emerge by reframing repositioning zooming in out uh, putting things in a two different context solutions may emerge or may become possible um, if found in a dialogue then on Innovation, uh, two ideas. One is on the art and discipline of execution. 
And then, well, we we know that so many more innovations are required, but a lot is also around the uh, skill of giving a good idea a chance to succeed. So, um, you know, uh, pure idea generation is rather cheap, and the the um, instead the getting things done and bringing the innovation to market is a whole different story. So um, it's just something worth considering as a business school student and possibly also as a teacher. There's an, a complementary thought from industrial design, and th that is to think along the Maya principle, which is what's the most advanced yet still acceptable way of pushing things forward. I mean, Clearly, uh, for anything that is new, one can easily uh, overstretch it. And, and here, the example from Adidas comes to mind already uh, towards, yeah, it's, it's almost, let me, 2024, almost at uh, 25 years ago, they already had a solution of making a sport shoe out of um, ocean pet plastic. <clears throat> and and other textiles, but uh, it's been only a few years back that these products actually found a customer. So um, luckily, they're large enough to hold on uh, during that time. But um, here, clearly, their their product of reusing plastic for a new product um, upcycling was by far too advanced for consumers back then. An encouraging thought from evolutionary psychology, which is that uh, the way I grew up with, it's there was clearly that idea that the DNA um, defines very much who we are, and then there's family or those around us and uh, cultural determinants, but basically uh, the, the DNA is given. But in the meantime, we know from adult development and evolutionary psychology, that it's really the people around us who shape us more and develop us more even in adult ages. And then followed by um, nurture, that is family upbringing and uh, actually the physical DNA basis. So I think this is very encouraging because that cultural element who and, and uh, is something that we can choose and design. Um, circling back to the beginning of this talk, it's very much about values. So the question is, uh, who can we team up with to share the same values, to reinforce what matters to us, and to help us realize those plans that require realization? <clears throat> so um, I think this is very encouraging and uh, gives a further nuance to step up or get out of the way. Actually, you can step up and it's very much a matter of allowing yourself to step up. So plan beats no plan also for individuals and is something that for, for businesses, of course, it will be anchored in impact transparency, anchored in their, in their purpose. And for individuals, it will be an expression of what matters to them, what their value system is. And if we do get the framing right, and if we do find um, answers that we need to find answers to them, then actually we can flip the VUCA from volatility to vision and uncertainty into understanding, possibly complexity to clarity, and for sure ambiguity to agility. With that, I'd like to close with a quote by Christiana Figueres, onwards with outrage and optimism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Yes. Uh, let's see if you can unshare and uh, let's open to the floor for discussion. And wow. Uh, okay. I already have one. Yes. Gibbs. Yes. Uh, from Richard. Yes. Richard. Yes. Uh, unmute, please. Can you repeat your question? I think he's blocked. He got disconnected. Yeah, maybe uh, while we wait for Richard to come back, I think Bart has a question. Yes. Bart, yes. Thank you, Sonia, for uh, for the speech and, and for the insights you have uh, provided us with. Um, 
I'm currently myself working on a, on a thesis, I would say, uh, regarding financial materiality, and I'm also making the links with impact investments. Um, I was wondering, can you share how difficult it, it was to, to roll out uh, the impact measurement at at Novartis was it really uh, to, uh, was it difficult to to achieve it was it a, really a journey you had to go through and to convince people that it was was bringing added value or was that trajectory quite quite smooth actually to convince people of the benefit of of impact measurement? Yeah, thank you, Bart. Um, actually, I started eight and a half years ago, right? At that point in time, impact investing didn't exist or only for a few um, experts, really. So it wasn't the natural thing that one would consider at all. It was more a question that uh, once we learned about it in, in accounting, I'm in the accounting department still, um, where we thought like that could be something where from a finance and accounting background, we could actually contribute to the emerging sustainability discussion with what we were best at, with quantitative approaches. And then from there on, well, you know, uh, was it difficult? I mean, I used Excel, VLOOKUPs, so no, not difficult. So it, it was more on then why did the company stay engaged? Well, that required the creativity of finding use cases, right? <clears throat> so here was the first hurdle uh, on feasibility proven and first two pilot projects delivered with Kenya and, uh, and China, um, basically reflecting philanthropic and corporate social responsibility engagements and a full-fledged operations, including research and development, the, the, the feasibility question was answered. It, it was feasible and the figures resonated internally and externally. And then the question was, well, why would one stay engaged? Is that resonance strong enough? And it turned out to be strong enough. So this is what the, what kept the activity going. And this is why Novartis is one of the founding members as well of the Value Balancing Alliance. And this is how I could contribute to the World Economic Forum debates on sustainability metrics and the embankment project and all of the other type of metrics-based conversations. Okay. So... <laughs> If I, Sonia, if I can just dive in, because I, 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 what you said is exactly right, but it hasn't been easy. And I don't think any company that sort of takes even now this sort of impact uh, approach is going to find everyone suddenly says this is the way forward. Because if you, if you look at other companies that are, are, are trying to take a lead in this place, people who are in government affairs, public relations, ESG even, see the impact story as actually a rather more serious approach to some of these things with some implications which if 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 they become real will have consequences for the, the business businesses involved which you know some of these other formulations won't have so uh, I, I and you have had some uh, resistance internally at times so. <laughs> yeah i i i didn't want to deny that but i mean the key thing is certainly not that it's technically not possible to do so it's not that one cannot get to those figures one can get to those figures rather quickly um and then the question is how does one own up to insights and uh, and that that very experience is actually a reason why i uh, expanded so much on the notion of debriefing and sense making out of those impact valuation results, once the figures are there, John, um, I, I felt I needed to capture that in my book just because the the figures themselves don't don't tell a story and don't translate into insights nor action for that matter. And and yes, because of the consistency of the approach, this reliability comes, of course, with uh, a reduced flexibility on on maybe um, open storytelling. So, um, but yeah, Bart Bart is coming at this from the notion of financial materiality. So, so impact measurement and valuation. The way I presented it, Bart is value to society, and that is not necessarily immediately value to business. Of course, one would think that if one caters meaningfully for 
one stakeholders that that would translate to value uh, and, and my financial market examples uh, hopefully substantiated that, but um, what's typically dealt with under the notion of financial materiality is something else, as you know. It's it's much, much more narrow considerations on risks on um, on profits in a in a shorter term. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you, Sonia. I think there are some questions on the chat room. Before I come to Vladimir, those on the chat room, if you can come live after I give the floor to Vladimir, I think that's very good. Okay, Vladimir, you can ask. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sonia, uh, for the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> the impact in value is very related to the acronym ESG, as, as you showed us. Uh, don't you think in the ESG acronym, the E and the S, are, uh, they are much more valued than the G? Uh, as you showed, uh, ES is impact, ES, uh, and, the, and the G is more related to the business and not to the impact to the society. But don't, don't you think that the G uh, should have a, a greater uh, relevance uh, in terms of, of uh, not just the business, but in terms of impact, uh, in a way that uh, it makes the company more, more trustable, uh, it uh, uh, so it, 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 and it can bring value to the whole value chain, to the investors, uh, to the shareholders. Uh, so, don't you think there is a downgrade in the G in this acronym? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Vladimir. Um, I struggle with ESG. But nonetheless, let me let me give answers on two levels. One is for E, S and G. E, S and G are not on the same level. So notions on environmental and uh, social matters are different from governance, where governance is the way management brings these hopefully substantially positive changes to bear. So it's it's just not comparable and it's sort of odd that it's been lumped together, also grammatically dissatisfying that it's been lumped together. Anyway, so then the second approach to this is um, this is the 20th anniversary of ESG as it was launched by the UN. And um, still the spirit is pretty much one on risk to profitability, risk on the company's operations for investors. So ESG is not a stakeholder interested setup. It's not anything to do with value to the planet, anything to do with value to society or humanity. Whereas impact is, so this, this may appear hypocritical and, and way too, way too um, granular a, a debate, but I think words matter here. And, and uh, just because ESG is, now uh, recently made uh, a career uh, thanks to its focus on uh, financial markets. This doesn't mean that this is the right thing to do. So ESG is the main focus of compliance. ESG is uh, companies understanding how many assets they will lose if sea levels rise and if there are more droughts and so forth. It does not tell the story of their positive value creation. It does not tell the story on which are the opportunities Opportunities they can be taking it does not tell a story on where they make a difference to the world as opposed to their competitors. So, as you can tell, I can, I can hardly I can hardly hide from you. Um, I, I, I find ESG highly problematic, and uh, all the related compliance is unfortunately forcing every one of us in a bit of a detour. Thank you, thank you, Sonia. Let's defer to Richard, yes. Uh, apologies for the technical error earlier. Um, Sonia or John, um, with regards to impact accounting and so on, were you, do you apply the same standards across your global business as an MNC or do you um, 
sort of cherry pick the types of things that you want to achieve in those um or in certain jurisdictions to appease that legislative body or is it easier just to create your own values and stay true to them throughout the organization I guess that's a question to me, John. Allow me to answer to to Richard. So um, uh, all of the data points at Novartis are derived from centrally available uh, databases that are managed centrally and come with the same definitions. So um, as sustainability reporting improves, all of these data points will continue to improve, not to say that things are perfect, but it's it's the same. And basically, this is pretty much the background of how the use cases have come about at Novartis um, is due to that consistency that has allowed transferability of use cases of collective learning, but also an acceptance then on regional levels and on global level. Great, thank you. Richard, if I could also... And, and, and as an intrapreneur, it, I couldn't have done it differently. I couldn't have done point to point. I, that, I mean, I started as a one woman show in the meantime there's a small team but i would have killed myself if i had tried to reinvent the wheel for everybody specifically if, if i could just add to it i think that um what sonia said was was exactly right um and one of the things that's changed over the last 20 years or so is that ngos and civil society organizations and so on have a much greater visibility on what companies are doing through their supply chains. I mentioned Ecovadis, that's just one element of this emergent story. So if companies do try and do things differently across their sort of global presence or footprints or whatever, people will find out about it. And one of the things that's happened over time too, is that although it's still very difficult for people to do the whistle blowing, it, 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 it can blow back against the individuals um, involved very seriously uh, companies know that they are much more leaky in the sense that people will hear about some of the things that they're doing and particularly things that are not being done right so I think that that sort of almost cultural uh, environment has changed and at the same time you've got for example with AI which we were talking about earlier on the Googles and the Microsofts now they know that they can't operate different standards in different parts of the world. So if the EU major market adopts certain standards, then these major multinationals are going to have to do something that is equivalent across the board. It's very difficult to micromanage different markets in different ways. But finally, to your question, that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of companies out there trying to do that and who will continue to do it because they think they will get away with it because they have a lower profile or no one really terribly cares uh, about what they're doing. So it, it, it's a mixed picture. Uh, but I think the very big players will find that they have very little choice uh, in the matter. And so right. I know Thank you very much. Early. So just. OK, thank, thank you, John and Sonia. I want to see if there's any question on the Zoom, I mean, the chat room. There's a question by Sawe. You want to come live or I can interpret your question? Is Sawe here? Uh, the question reads, do you think evolutionary psychology has any impact over behavioral economics of consumption? So I believe he's talking about evolutionary psychology means survival instinct and trying to live uh, versus our modern consumption patterns and habits. Uh, should, should we just focus on survival? In other words, some of things like degrowth or going, going, you know, uh, be more sustainable, be a donut economy, or whether we should continue our behavioral patterns or consumption. So I think this is a gist of the question. Should we do that? What we call the balance? Uh, Sonia or John, you want to add to this uh, the trade off between uh high velocity growth or just moderated growth Look, shall i have a first go sonia um i don't properly understand what evolutionary psychology is here but yesterday i had a fascinating conversation with somebody who was originally a psychologist that was her training 
she's worked in prisons and all sorts of other strange, uh, complicated, stressful environments. So she, she, she is not simply an academic uh, or theoret theoretical uh, psychologist. And what she was talking about was the way in which over periods of time, people's understanding of complex issues does change, but it very rarely changes in a straight line. And what you very often have is long periods of time when absolutely nothing seems to be happening very much, but people are becoming uncomfortably aware that there are problems. And then things change in very short order. But the problem is that when that happens, it doesn't go in a sensible direction always. You have populist politicians, you have scapegoating, as we would say in English, where people start to blame everyone else for what's happened, not themselves. Um, so you, you have very complex emotions and, and, and psychological and cultural uh, reactions. And my sense is the next, as I keep saying, the next 10 to 15 years are going to see an immense amount of that because we've delayed action on so many of these different fronts, these challenges and agree opportunities opportunities as well that we're going to be forced to do it faster than we would naturally want to do it and that's going to lead to all sorts of forms of resistance so i think over time evolutionary psychology if that involves an embrace of sustainability and things like that could actually push aside some of the consumption driven mindsets and behaviors and so on that we've adopted over a very long time but i don't think it's going to happen overnight i think it's going to be a quite a long protracted process sonia uh, no change happens overnight typically but uh, to me the more interesting question is we're not bystanders in this we're we're actors in this and <clears throat> So the question very much becomes, are we the change that we want to see? So uh, it's not so much a matter of which science prevails over another or which paradigm. The question is very much a personal one. Which paradigm do you want to see prevail? What is the world that you want to live in, what, that you want to live, have your sons, daughters, nieces um, live in, if there are any. How do you picture the future in 100 years for humanity, for in 50 years? And what would be a dream scenario if you think about these things and then tracing backwards to what are the things here and now that, that we need to do? And the reason why I focus on the individual here is certainly not to burden individuals with too much of the accumulated responsibility, not at all, but to give a, a sense of agency. We can't be in this without a sense of agency. And some of the questions can easily be uh, on a level where we can just, where we just feel that it's up to someone else or the right science or the right approach to sort of emerge. And then when, when that um, paradigm is there, then things will be fine. But which is a perspective that totally neglects that we are a part of that system and our voices are as valuable as anybody else's. We're living, we, we mentioned democracies. We have uh, a voice there. We we are leaders of our lives in our businesses. We do interact with others. So the values that we are portraying, that our choices are visible and do make a difference. Okay, thank you, Sonia. I think Professor Tomo, uh, you can come next with your question. Hi, Sonia. Um, thank you so much for your participation. And uh, I'm Tomo Noda from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am <clears throat> asking you and Joe a uh, very basic question as a student, one of the students. So uh, early on, uh, Taifa Bibi uh, wrote down in chat box, are there any notable challenges or criticisms associated with the concept of impact variation? And uh, I myself has been thinking of this. I read up to chapter seven of your book. Sorry, that I didn't have time. I wasn't able to finish, but I read through chapter seven, chapter seven. And I began to feel that, yes, this is great. 
And I really, really, really want to see that your activity expand into Asia and Japan and you know, other parts of the Asia. But the, in the meantime, I was puzzled. Uh, nothing is perfect, but value ev impact evaluation is sometimes subjective, partial, picky, selective, because company activity is so uh, the, uh, encompassing uh, all of the aspects and making an impact on various aspects. So as compared with simple shareholder value calculation, uh, the uh, impact evaluation can be partial, again, selective, subjective. So uh, sometimes I as a, uh, think that may be a one of the criticism toward uh, impact evaluation. Uh, am I right? If I am right, how do you see the challenges ahead of you and John and we, uh, all the people in business? And the second issue is, do we need to integrate all the various impact company create? Uh, ultimate, the, the otherwise, how we can compare uh, as a company A and company B, business A and business B. We are almost like comparing apples and oranges. And beauty of shareholder value is we can compare oranges and oranges. Apples and apples. So if we embark on uh, the journey of uh, impact evaluation, how can we reconcile this kind of uh, the challenges of comparing apples and oranges? Sorry, that's, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm asking the right questions or not. So if I am wrong, please. Any wait. question is the right one, Tomo. Uh, any questions? The right one. Thank you, Tomo. So um, there, there are several layers on on this one. Of course, the uh, established metrics are uh, comparable. They are established. They're they're square. They're, they're meters of libraries fooled with how to deal with shareholder value and which metrics to utilize. Uh, that doesn't make it better because all of that still ignores environmental and social issues and any of the things that, that we're concerned in this talk. So the question is, how can we modify that? And to me, in, as you could guess from the book and from the talk, to me, the only promising approach here is because of its comp consistency, because of its linkage, I indeed, impact measurement and valuation. Now, it's not perfect because it's emerging and because there's no established standard, right? So uh, one of the drivers for me to actually contribute to founding the Value Balancing Alliance was exactly that. We, we need comparability beyond a company. I mean, it's nice to create business value cases internally, but the next scaling element is only possible when more companies adopt the exact same techniques, the exact same approach with the same algorithms where their estimates required so that the capital market has the, the opportunity to do comparisons across an entire portfolio or at least for one sector. This is not possible today. That's right. It's though not a weakness of the concept. It's a weakness of the lacking adoption. And in my mind, adoption can come through two ways. One is um, a compliance requirement or some, some sort of pressure from either the consumer market or the financial market or intrinsic motivation where one finds business value in this type of thinking. So this is uh, maybe giving you a, a bit more background on why I stressed certain elements in the talk as well. Tomo, does that make any sense to you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John, and uh, that since you proposed triple bottom lines, uh, you may have received similar kind of uh, challenges, criticisms. So uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, the future of uh, the, the impact evaluation, impact accounting, uh, where we are heading for, what kind of challenges we, we have uh, at hand? Yeah, I, I, I think several things. One is that, um, 
Sonia talked about the VUCA world with increasing complexity. That's the future that we're moving into, whether we like it or not. Your question, Tomo, is a, partly about can we use these new methodologies and processes and techniques and toolkits and so on to get a better sense of how to manage our way through that complexity? Part of my answer goes to we may fail. If I look at life cycle assessment, for example, there was a lot of excitement around that 25, 30 years ago. Uh, it's still used to some degree, but but you know, we, we, we went through that peak uh, period of, of enthusiasm. You can't see, but I mean, this is an iPhone. Uh, I remember working with very early um, versions of what we now take for granted, where we have supercomputers in our hands and maybe we use them for the wrong uh, purposes and so on but the potential to do um, in the moment analysis of materials of products of, of companies even is potentially much greater now than it was 20 years ago and I think we're on one of these exponential curves doesn't mean that we'll use that power um, uh, and, and those technologies sensibly but the potential to do so i think is greater than it has ever uh, been but i think it's an intergenerational process and i think one of the things i really want to see is much better and closer working between the generations i see older people tending to say we tried we failed with climate change or whatever over to younger people i think younger people cannot be just told to go and deal with these problems we've got to work together and I think, as I said earlier on, education is a critical part of that. But these new ways of thinking, and I almost see impact as a language that we're all going to have to learn to speak over time uh, in business, but also in the wider world. So my fingers are crossed. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. I think what Sonny has done within Novartis and the Value Balancing Alliance has been extraordinary because it just shows how one individual or you know individuals uh, over time can really change the agenda but your 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 question domo is a very useful caution and i think we're going to have to remember to just keep that in mind there's one other question that came up in the chat which was around china and and the, was i um criticizing China more than I was the United States of America or the European Union or whatever. I think my cases were skewed towards China, perhaps. But the, but the as I said in the chat, I think every country, every geographical region, every sort of regional economy at the moment can have criticisms leveled against it in the same way. So don't, don't take me as anti-Chinese. It's a mm -hmm. country I find both fascinating and frightening at times. <laughs> okay, very good. I guess we are just exactly on the half hour and this is almost the end. I believe if there's no more question or any last final word from Professor Tomo, I can end the session and by thanking everybody. Professor Tomo, you want to say any more thing before I thank all the speakers or should I leave it to you to thank John and Sonia for such a wonderful, insightful fashion. And I think it's going to have an impact on my sleep tonight because I'm going to reflect <laughs> and think about all the questions and answers. Yeah. Okay, Flores, uh, Professor Tomo and uh, Junichi, will hand that to you. Flores, Junichi will close the session. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yes, Junichi. Thank you, Lawrence. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lawrence. Uh, thank you, uh, John and Sonia, for your wonderful uh, sharing, your wonderful insights. Uh, very quickly, announcing the last session next week. So next week at the same hour, uh, Tuesday 16 at 1 p.m. Central European time, we will have the last session of this course uh, to discuss about role and responsibility of business leaders and enterprises, uh, inviting Professor Jan Peter Barkenande. Uh, and also Paul Polman. The session will be facilitated by uh, Professor George Olcott, Shizenka University. Uh, sorry, I missed one person. We will also invite uh, Professor Gubert Bouges from uh, co-author uh, together with young Peter Barkinand.
So we will have three speakers next week. So thank you very much and see you next week. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.